Yo, what is going on guys? Before we get into this video, I want to give a huge shout out to the homies Argon and that's the bruh. Make sure you guys go to their channels in the description, like all their videos, subscribe to them, turn on notifications, follow them on all social media, all that good stuff. They provided me with some awesome gameplay for this video, so make sure you guys go check them out. So gentlemen, thank you guys so much for helping me out with this video. Let's get into it guys. Fortnite, Call of Duty, which is better? Well, you can't really compare those two games based on just gameplay, so don't answer that question. What is going on YouTube? Foxy Girl, welcome to you guys today with a brand new video, and in today's video, I'm going to explain the big difference between Fortnite and Call of Duty World War II. Now, before all of you coconut heads get all bent out of shape about how they're two completely different games, you can't compare Fortnite and Call of Duty! This video has nothing to do with how each game plays. The two games play completely different, that is obvious. One game is a crazy battle royale game where you build your fortress like a demigod and sit in bushes like a little bitch. The other is an incomplete FPS juggernaut where you sit in a corner with an incendiary shotgun like a pussy and sit on top of a cannon with your sniper rifle like your face testy, a complete badass. However, behind the scenes, the games are completely different. You're probably thinking, Who in the blue hell are you? Well. The difference between Fortnite and Call of Duty World War II, or Call of Duty in general, is the developers. The people who made the games, that's the difference. Let's go, bros. Let us take a look at both developers. In the right hand corner, we got Epic Games Incorporated and People Can Fly, the developers of the almighty Fortnite. Epic Games Incorporated and People Can Fly are two privately held companies. What are privately held companies? Privately held companies are either owned by non-governmental organizations or by a relatively small number of shareholders, kind of like stocks and shit. Basically, they don't have to answer to any major publishers. For example, a major publisher is Activision. However, in Fortnite's case, Epic Games is the publisher. And in the left hand corner, we have World War II developer Sledgehammer Games. Sledgehammer Games is a subsidiary company. What are subsidiary companies, you might ask? Well, subsidiary companies are owned or controlled by another company. The other company would be called their quote-unquote parent. The parent to Sledgehammer Games is Activision Publishing. And basically, Activision makes the final decision. In conclusion, Epic Games answers to themselves, and Sledgehammer Games answers to Activision. So, Fortnite. It seems that Epic Games is hip and in touch with their fans. Since Fortnite's Battle Royale mode was released to the public in the fall of 2017, the game has made quite the bit of noise in the gaming community. For Epic Games, they've been around since 1991, and I would consider them the quote-unquote new Bungie. You know, the Bungie that used to make the old Halo games? Yeah, those guys. The reason I say that is because I went back and I did a little bit of research on the old Halo games, and specifically Halo 2. So let's go back to 2005 when Halo 2 was THE game to play on Xbox Live. Do you guys remember when Halo 2 multiplayer map packs were released? These multiplayer map packs were released at a set price, but two months after they were released, they were made permanently free. Originally, the Maptacular pack was released on July 5th, 2005 for $11.99 and was made permanently free on August 30th of 2005. The Blastacular pack was released on April 17th, 2007 for four bucks and was free on July 7th, 2007. Not only were these made free, but the bonus map pack was released on April 25th, 2005 and it was free at release. Actually, it was required to download the bonus map pack in order to play Halo 2 on Xbox Live. Now, in my opinion, Fortnite does the same thing. I've talked to several people, and they said that Fortnite was incomplete at launch. Now, if this is true, I believe that Epic Games has an excuse for this because they had a separate development team focused on another active game called Paragon. So what does this mean? This means that Epic Games was working on two games at the same time. Once the player base began to decrease for Paragon, Epic Games took note of this and said that Paragon would be shut down by April. This was done so the team could focus completely on Fortnite. So now, Fortnite has more people working on the game than ever before and updates are coming out every single week. 
Epic Games saw the player base for Fortnite and saw the player base for Paragon and said, you know what, we need to focus on Fortnite because everyone is playing this game. Do you guys understand that there was 10 million people playing Fortnite? That's fucking insane. And because of this, Epic Games took it upon themselves to shut down one of their games. That makes sense for you guys, right? I hope it does. Also, they've added new additions to their map, released new weapons to give the player a variety of weapons to choose from, and they listen to what the community and fan base has to say. Let me give you guys an example. Fortnite was going to release a jetpack in the battle royal mode. And from the looks of Twitter, many fans were not thrilled about this. Epic Games released a statement about the jetpack saying that there were a few bugs and that they would hold off on releasing it. So instead of releasing the jetpack, they released a new hunting rifle instead. Do you see how they didn't shove a broken item into their game just for content purposes? The jetpack was not 100% completed and ready. So they gave people something else instead and kept working on the jetpack. That's how shit is supposed to work. That's one of the many qualities that Epic Games has to offer. They take their time on certain aspects of Fortnite and they don't rush anything. However, that could change if they stop listening to their fan base or get bought by a major publisher. Now, I'm not going to cover microtransactions too much because in Fortnite, we have V-Bucks. Now, I don't buy V-Bucks, I don't play Fortnite like that, so I had to do a little bit of research, and what I found is that the V-Bucks get you skins for guns, they get you outfits for your character, and that they get you parachutes. And honestly, as long as it stays that way, as long as the prices are reasonable, and it doesn't become the main focus of the developers, I don't see a problem with it. Now, the big thing that stuck out to me about Epic Games is the fact that they're answering everybody. I noticed that Epic Games listens to the community as a whole, and I think it's completely fucking awesome, because on console at least, we haven't seen developers like that since the days of like Halo 3 and Modern Warfare 2. It sucks. Next, we have Call of Duty World War 2. After I've done my research on Sledgehammer Games, it seems like Sledgehammer has always been out of touch with their fans. They were the first developers to implement jetpacks and microtransactions in the Call of Duty series, and it seems like they are the biggest puppet that Activision has. Both Advanced Warfare and World War II have shown this through the supply drops and how unfair they can be. Now let me put this disclaimer in here. The Call of Duty franchise needed a change when Advanced Warfare was released. However, if Sledgehammer Games had handled the game better, I feel like it would have been more successful. On a side note, the fact that this development team was going to come out with Advanced Warfare 2 instead of a boots on the ground Call of Duty game is enough evidence to show that Sledgehammer Games is out of touch with their fan base, at least a majority of us. I don't want to get too off topic, so let's look at Call of Duty World War 2 since it's the latest game. Call of Duty World War 2 was so hyped before launch, and that's because it was the first boots on the ground game since Call of Duty Ghosts. However, Sledgehammer Games was talking so much about campaign in the headquarters that we didn't get a complete game at launch. What did we get at launch for Call of Duty World War II? We got servers that didn't work, an empty headquarters, a flat gun event that didn't come until February, paint jobs that said coming soon and apparently were thrown in last minute. We also got nine multiplayer maps, of which all play the same, a pretty good campaign, and zombies that's okay. It's not amazing, but it's not awful, I guess. That's completely unacceptable. It's an incomplete game. Now, I wouldn't be pointing out all the flaws in this game if Sledgehammer Games would communicate and give us the right information. When it comes to communication with their fans and community, Sledgehammer Games doesn't seem to communicate very well. Well, let me rephrase that. Michael Condry didn't seem to communicate very well with the fans. I don't like it. A recent patch came out on World War II, and it fixed a lot of the issues that players were having when playing multiplayer. For example, the sprint out times were a huge problem, and Condry said it isn't likely that it could be fixed. Condry was given a promotion by Activision, and Sledgehammer Games named Aaron Hallen the new studio head. Not even a week after Condry was given the promotion, sprint out times were fixed by the new studio head. Doesn't that say something? That's gotta say something, man. It might not have been Sledgehammer Games as a whole development team. It may have been Condry being stubborn and set in his ways. In my opinion, I feel that Condry wanted people to play World War II the way he wanted the game to be played. He wanted the game to be played in his way instead of how the fans wanted to play it. Another example of this is Domination having 50 points per kill. But everyone knows about that, and it should be 100 points per kill. But once again, I feel like Condry was stubborn and set in his ways. 
Don't be surprised if Dom XL ends up being a permanent playlist in the game. As for Sledgehammer games, I think I've experienced enough of them and their duplicate grips all the goddamn time to understand how they work with Michael Condry at the head. However, since Condry moved up to Activision, things have gotten slightly better. In conclusion, the difference between Call of Duty World War II and Fortnite is the developers. I feel the developers of Call of Duty don't put as much effort into the games they make because Call of Duty is already the biggest first person shooter juggernaut on the planet. They have no competition in the first person shooter genre and they're sitting on their throne being lazy. You could try to make the argument for games like Halo, Destiny, and Battlefield, but honestly, there's no first person shooter game that has the throne like Call of Duty does. And every time one of those games is released at the same time as Call of Duty is, Call of Duty always beats them in sales, always. In contrast to the developers of Call of Duty, Epic Games is trying to make a bigger name for themselves, and Fortnite is launching them into another stratosphere. Epic Games has something to prove, whereas the Call of Duty developers don't, because they've already made it. But that's going to do it for this video, guys. I hope you all did enjoy. What do you guys think? Do you guys agree? Do you guys disagree? Let's have a discussion in the comments. Make sure you guys leave a like on the video, subscribe, turn on notifications, follow me on Twitter, link is down in the description below. Thank you guys so much for watching, I appreciate it all, and I'll see you guys later. Goodbye!